Hi, I'm Mick Garris. Tonight on Take One, we're going to take a look at horror films. And we're going to talk to some of the people who have made some of the finest horror films around. Uh, our guests include John Landis, whose first film he made at the age of 21, Schlock, a monster comedy. Also made Kentucky Fried Movie, The Blues Brothers, National Lampoon's Animal House, and An American Werewolf in London. John Carpenter, who made his first feature film as a USC student, Dark Star, for $60,000, also made Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York, and is currently working on The Thing. David Cronenberg, whose films include Rabid, The Brood, They Came From Within, and Scanners, is currently working on a new film called Videodrome. John, why do you think horror films are so popular? I can't really answer that with a uh, generalization that will hold true, but what is true is the genre of monster films and horror films has been consistent throughout the history of the business. If you look at the decades of the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, there's always cycles of westerns and war movies and comedies. But there have been horror films straight through. The only difference is in budgets, whether they're A pictures or B pictures. Why are they so popular? I guess because they're really entertaining, I hope. What frightens you, John Carpenter? I um, don't get frightened by movies. Okay. Movies don't scare me, no. Ever? Yeah. You've never been scared? When I was a little kid. All right. <laughs> what movie? What movie? The movie that scared me the most was probably It Came From Outer Space. Did you see it in it the theater in 3D? It was in 3D. I was four years old. I was sitting near the front, and the meteor came out of the screen and blew up in my face. And I jumped up and ran to the back, and I said, Whoa, God, what was that? And ran back down again. Do you think that had an effect on the, your attitude in filmmaking? Nah. <laughs> nah. OK, let's talk a little bit about the thing. What uh, was the beginning of the whole project? Um, Universal wanted to do a remake of, of The Thing, which was a film in 1950, 51, directed by Christian Nyby, co-directed by Howard Hawks, based on a short story by John Campbell called Who Goes There? And it was uh, an excellent film, one of my favorite movies. It was uh, James Arness as a giant blood-drinking carrot from outer space. <laughs> Did it scare you when you saw it? It was time? a chairlifter for me. <laughs> popcorn, popcorn <laughs> flu. But, um, I realized that I really couldn't remake the thing from the movie. It just wouldn't work out. So uh, we went back to the short story, which is an entirely different sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> it's more about a creature that can become um, you rather than kill you. And physically become Physically you. become you, imitate you perfectly, cell for cell. So that uh, these men in this Arctic camp suddenly realize that their friends are maybe not their friends. And if they don't stop it, it can become the population of the world in about two weeks, if it gets any further than this Arctic camp. And um, when it's threatened, uh, the thing goes through several incantations and does some strange things to the human body. And, and that's what the movie's about. We're going to take a look at a clip from the thing right now. And then we'll talk about that when we come back. What kind of cell structure is this? Well, you see, that's the point. I don't get your blam. I'm not sure it is any kind of cell structure. At least as we know cell structure. You see, when this thing attacked our dogs, it tried to shape its own cells to imitate theirs. We got to it before it had time to finish. Finish what? Finish imitating these dogs. You're saying that that thing in the ice was trying to become our dogs? Yeah. Seems to be able to imitate other life forms. So what's our problem? The thing's not dead yet. Great. David, is there anything you think should not be shown in films? If you want to take that as an absolutely blanket general question, no, I don't think there's anything that should not be shown in films. Specifically, your films are known for a lot of graphic violence. Um, so let's they specifically move into, into yeah. your films. Yeah, they have been. No, I think it really depends on the tone of the film. It depends on what the film is trying to do. I mean, I have been offended by violence in movies, uh, but primarily because I think that, uh, I can't think of a specific instance, but because I think, let's say, that the violence is completely gratuitous within the context of the movie. That is to say, every movie has its own rules, and you can really set up any game that you want, but once you do that, you really have to play that game, otherwise the audience feels 
uh, they know that something's wrong, that something's not working. Your films are probably best known, uh, symbolized by the exploding head at the beginning of Scanners. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about that? Well, it's, uh, how do I feel that, about it being one of the... The, the symbol of your work. Oh, I think it's very, I think it's very appropriate because uh, the, uh, the idea of a, of a, of a, of a mind that, that can't be phys an energy in a mind that can't be physically contained is, is, is very appropriate, I think, to, to the way I feel sometimes. <laughs> and um, so on, on, and just in terms of the, the, the effectiveness of that effect and the way it worked in the context of the movie, I'd be happy to be known by that for a while anyway, until the next movie. When you talk about censorship, uh, you have to get into the ratings problem. Do you have uh, any particularly strong feelings about the ratings board? Yes. <laughs> um, the United very few people realize this, but the United States is the only country in the world that does not have government-imposed censorship. Um, we have a self-regulating board of the Motion Picture Association of America whose job is to reflect the current mores. For instance, I made a movie called Kentucky Fried Movie, which was five years ago. They had a scene... Uh, of lovemaking where the girl was on top and it was fairly graphic <clears throat> and that got an R rating. Um, now with uh, the moral majority and equally despicable groups screaming uh, an identical scene in uh, American Werewolf in a porno movie projected on a screen was considered enough to get me an X. It was the same, it was the same shot and when I said well wait a minute you know it, what are you talking about they explained it to me and, and they're correct they're saying our job is to reflect the mores of the time which means President Reagan is president, which means violence, in fact, is okay, and uh, sexuality is evil and corrupt. It's sick. <laughs> Most horror films having an R rating, it seems to take it out of the hands of kids generally. Does that? I think, I wish they'd stick with R ratings, because I think that young kids shouldn't see some, some stuff. What do you, where would you draw the line? Would you have given Halloween an R rating? Sure. Sure. How about The Fog? No. PG. Was it, it was originally intended as a PG, isn't it? It was always intended as a PG, and even with the stuff, uh, additional stuff that we shot to make it a little stronger, I still think it's a PG film. It's a kid's film. What did it get? R. It got an R. Because at that time, violence was unpopular. I mean, it See, I had an experience like John's. I was a producer of a film called Halloween 2, and we submitted it to the rating board, and it's the same thing. The sexual part of Halloween 2 was hit on, and it said, this is an X unless you change this. Really? The violence was no problem. David, you've also had problems as far as X and R ratings in your film. Scanners was originally an X. Well, every picture that I've done was has originally gotten an X here in the States. But, uh, but you have to understand that I live in Ontario, Canada, which used to be the most <coughs> liberal province and now is the most restrictive. Right. So I have to agree, or, or, or let, let me amplify what John was saying. Uh, when I came down here to, to talk to the MPAA about ratings, it was still a relief compared with what happens in, in Ontario, which is that they take your picture, they take every print, and they cut it, and they hand it back to you, and they say, this is your new movie. They keep the, the pieces that they've taken out, and you go to jail for two years if those are projected, if you put the pieces back. And that's real censorship. And yeah, so I mean, what you've got here, however imperfect it may be, uh, at least it's, it, you know, you still have the option of releasing the film as an X. And of course, there are huge economic sanctions against doing that, and usually you have a contractual obligation not to have an X. Nonetheless, if you really want it to be an X, you can still get it shown here. In, in, in Canada, you go to jail. Yeah. So I would say that, that you know, I, I think what you need here is another uh, category, you know, something like 14 and over or something, because I, I agree with, with John that, that uh, I wouldn't want, a th I, I, when Shivers, which here was called They Came From Within, was first shown here, I drove down to Buffalo just to see it in another country. And I was really quite upset to see someone bringing a three-year-old girl in to see this film. And I had a three-year-old daughter at the time, and I didn't think that the kid should see the movie. Uh, and uh, obviously left to adults and uh, you know, parents and guardians, it's just not going to work. I th and, and that's one of the reasons that on our, they're being very tough with like, handing out R ratings here, is because they know that kids are going to get to see these movies with or without parents. If you had a, a, a serious restriction against anybody, say 13 or 14 and under, seeing this movie at all, but above that age they could go to see it by themselves, that would be, and you had that as a separate category, which they have in one of the provinces in, in Canada, that I think would help a lot. Do you think horror films are, are cathartic or potentially harmful? 
I don't or believe, neither. I don't believe they're potentially harmful. Um, there are a lot of people who do. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, yes, I think they can be cathartic. It doesn't have to be. Again, getting back, it depends entirely on the individual film. Uh, you make generalizations, you can't... I mean, I'm known as a maker of comedies, and I always made a strong generalization in my own mind. I always made a rule. Blood is not funny. Gore is not funny. If someone's injured, it has to be done in a very straight slapstick way. Um, and then I saw a film called Monty Python in Quest of the Holy Grail, in which a guy is severed limb by limb. It was hysterical. And I was fascinated by them. They're breaking my rule. And I'm laughing. And I realized it all depends on the individual... Because the vast majority of horror and monster films are dreck. What do you think really represents your films? Uh, well, you were talking about the exploding head, but um, uh, in fact, I think it really has... My films tend to be very body conscious. Uh, the, 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 the body and, and what it is and what it does and what it can do tends to be very central in my films. And it was never a conscious thing, but I gradually realized that, that I was more interested in uh, th things that happen inside you mentally and physically than I was in, in, in a kind of exterior uh, threat, which is why the, you could, I think, legitimately say that none of my films are monster movies in that sense. In fact, it, it, to a certain extent, you, it, it's your own body that's the monster, there's your a, own existence. There's an image in Rabid that is one of the most frightening things I've ever seen when uh, <coughs> the doctor, in the middle of surgery, goes rabid and slices the nurse's finger. I mean, yeah. that scared me to death. I mean, it was oh, just... Good. No, but I mean, it was such a remarkable image, that mm -hmm. authority figure. You know, well, yeah. that's, it, that's exactly the thing. And I mean, it, it, talking about the thing, uh, it, the, the, uh, the idea that someone close to you, I mean, this, the, the I promo for, for Rabbit was you can't trust your mother, you can't trust your neighbor, you know, you can't trust your best friend. One minute they're normal, the next minute they're Rabbit. Uh, the idea, you know, I, I don't mean to get it, it, very Freudian about it, but the idea that, for example, a parent suddenly wants to destroy its own child uh, is very frightening because a parent is supposed to do exactly the opposite. So that kind of turnaround and, and the, the psychological reality behind it and the potential and the possibility of it all is what makes uh, is the kind of horror that, that I'm interested in. And so it's, it's, it's all very internal. And, and the, the fact that the Shivers in, in Canada is called They Came From Within Here is, is it's appropriate. They Came From Within is exact. Instead of From Outer Space, I think that's, that shows you the orientation that I have when I make films. Sex and violence is something that's a, a recurrent theme in your <coughs> films and seems to be the major theme in Videodrome. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it, it deals with, uh, God, it's, it's actually hard to deliver in one line, but it has to do with the man who runs a, a cable, a very schlocky cable TV station, and he, he tries to, he monitors uh, video from all over the world in order to, to take pirate free, free things and show them on his little station because he, he feels that he needs to show really extreme stuff to, to attract an audience because he can't compete with networks and so on. And he finds, he discovers a very strange show called Videodrome which seems to be nothing but, but torture and murder uh, and, and uh, seems very realistic. And he becomes very obsessed with this show and very fascinated by it and he begins to delve into it further and further. And then it starts to get very strange after that. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about the use of special effects in uh, creating scenes of horror or whatever. Uh, that was a major event in American Werewolf. It took a lot of time. You mean in the production? In the production of the film. Oh, yeah. It was a 10-week schedule. It took one week to shoot the two minutes. It was horrendous because you'd show up, Rick and David Naughton and his crew would start... Rick Baker. Rick Baker, the, the makeup artist who's working with David Cronenberg now, um, would start... They'd start at like 5 in the morning and we'd come on, you know, making them up, and we'd come on set at 7, and we'd be lit and ready at 8, and then we'd sit there till 1, <laughs> which was horrendous. I hated it. And then they'd come out, and we'd shoot, you know, two shots, and I was like, see you tomorrow. <laughs> How terrible. long did it take to devise the effects? Months. It, it, to build it, it took months to devise it. I wrote uh, Werewolf in, uh, in 1969 in Yugoslavia. It was based on a real experience I had, believe it or not. And uh, I met Rick Baker in 1971 on Schlock. And he was then 20, and I told him I wanted this metamorphosis <coughs> for the movie to work. I really felt you couldn't use opticals, you couldn't use lap dissolves like Lon Chaney Jr. You, you had to see in bright light. You had to see a guy's metamorphosized. And, uh, and then, in 71, he first showed me his first change head, figured out how to do it. And Rick had worked with the great Dick Smith, and, uh, 
And in fact, Rob Bottin, who's working with John Carpenter, it's weird. They're all incestuous. <laughs> the they all work together. Um, and it was very frustrating for me because I felt it was very important in the film for the makeups and special effects to work. Again, because I'm treating it realistically. I'm treating it straight. And it's one thing to say, last night I turned into a werewolf. Nothing to see it happening to the guy and experience it with him. And uh, Rick, I guess, spent, he wanted 10 months. I think he got four <laughs> <laughs> to build to build everything. And uh, I'm very pleased with it. The makeups, in fact, throughout the film are pretty extraordinary because yeah. uh, you can't really... You can only build up on an actor's face, <laughs> and I had I had scenes where they have to carve down, you know, to his skull. So they ripped apart Griffin Dunn. In the we film. killed Griffin Dunn. It's <laughs> tragedy. Let's take a look at the transformation scene from an American Werewolf in London right now. Working with Rob Bottin on the thing, also very extensive uh, transformation type of effects and and other sorts of makeup effects. Is it more of a pain in the neck, or do you really enjoy the process? <clears throat> well, unlike John, we we have set aside um, about five months to shoot all the effects, apart separate and apart from the uh, first unit. Well, you have much more extensive than I did. I mean, they go on and on and on and yeah. on and on and on and on. And um, I, the same problems that John is describing, where you do one shot in a day or two shots in a day. And they are, they are a pain in the neck if you try to do them in, in your first unit. If you're trying to do them all at the same time, like uh, if I had a 10-week schedule and it took a week to do the transformations, the I would week. be out of my mind. It was the last week. We had shot all our, in fact, we shot all the inserts, so we had nothing to do. <laughs> so, I was gonna say, I read this, the screenplay uh, by Bill Lancaster of John's movie, and The Thing, the thing and it's just, Talk about demand. It's unbelievable what the, what is supposed to happen in the film. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. It's just <laughs> it's mind-boggling. Well, all of you have taken films that have scenes that really demand more of makeup effects than have been done previous to that time. Well, that's, I mean, makeup men, uh, people love that, of course. <laughs> I mean, they curse you because they can't fall back on things that they've done before. But on the other hand, as, as any creative person would be, they're very excited by an incredible challenge. So if you, you know, the chances are that you will, after all, there are really only a, a limited number of, of uh, fabulously good effects people. And there are a lot of films and, and producers who are clamoring for these people. So that in order, I mean, that's, that's another thing that you don't, you know, that's behind the scene. But... Uh, the chances that you'll get to work with somebody like Dick Smith or Rick Baker depend very much on how interesting and what kind of challenge it is that you're presenting them with. And if they're, if they're going to do something that they did 10 years ago, obviously it's not going to excite them as much as if it's something that 
that they know their own colleagues are going to phone them up and say, how did you do that? I mean, that's what they want. Although there's a new phenomenon that I see, because I'm a real monster movie buff, you know, I go see everything, no matter how schlocky, um, which is that it used to be that there'd be some pretty intelligently, you know, well-made, well-directed, well-acted, crafted films until the monster showed up. <laughs> the monster was so dumb-looking that it blew everything. Um, and now there's a whole new phenomenon, which is there have been a whole bunch of films that are just dreck, but the monsters look it's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's the thing. I mean, what does a producer say? He says, look, the only way we're going to sell this terrible film is on the basis of the special effects, the stills of the special effects. I think, I think Roger Corman had a lot to do with, with both sides of that. You know, I mean, if you're selling the Posters. artwork and the stills <laughs> and the title before there is a picture, what are you going to sell? You're not selling the dialogue. You are selling the monster. Or the effect. They used to, Corman used to do the, the NAFP, they do the poster. And First, then they yeah, make the movie, a movie. That's right. If the poster <laughs> got good part. reviews, then they'd make the picture. So th that, that means that you would apportion your budget. I mean, that happened to me on, on They Came From Within. In fact, right. I mean, we said, okay, look, when you have a dialogue scene, obviously it's three shots and goodbye. You know, <laughs> one take, forget it. <coughs> but when we have special effects, if it takes oh, all day, great. great. You know, we have that's to right. do it. And that's exactly the way that film was shot. Are you ever surprised by the reactions to your films, David, when you go in with an audience? Oh, constantly. Is there any particular yeah. time I used you go to, in? I used to think that, you know, when I was uh, younger and more arrogant and more ignorant, certainly, I used to think the idea of having previews for films was really a, a, a bizarre, cop-out, strange industry kind of thing, and I couldn't really understand what, what that was about. Uh, and I later realized that there's a very good reason for it, and, and I realized that, you know, I, w I used to think, well, a, a poet doesn't, you know, go out and preview his poetry, but in fact, I was wrong about that, too, because poets always used to go out and read their poetry in, to audiences, and they would refine it afterwards, and for the very same reason. And you get so close to it, after you worked on a picture for a year or two years or however long, that you begin to lose some kind of contact with it and you have to vicariously experience it again through an audience so that you can really see what it is. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. To, it is impossible to walk into one of your own movies, even 30 years later, I'm sure, and see it the way anybody just walking in cold would see it. You can't see it that way. Every shot has a history. Every cut has a history. Every actor, every prop has a history that... that that distorts your perception of your own film. You have to see it through through other eyes, and when you do that, you are constantly being surprised at at, at reactions to things. I mean, when it works exactly the way you thought it would, that's wonderful. It's very rare. Okay, have either of you actually, based on a preview, changed something very strongly? Sure. Like, give tell me a story. The fog. <laughs> what, what the happened? fog. I, I showed it to a bunch of people, and they didn't react the way I wanted them to, so I changed it. Is that you shot some additional footage that sure was did. harder? Right? Quick. I, I right actually away. moved the exploding head in scanners uh, 10 minutes into the film. It, it was originally three minutes and two minutes into the it film. Was the it was first the first scene. scene. Yes. Right. And based on audience reaction to that and the, and the general pacing of the film, the rhythm of the film, I realized it was wrong, but I couldn't tell. What's the biggest surprise the you've ever had by an audience uh, watching one of your films? That I've ever had? Yeah, have you? Well, two, actually. One was there's a line in Animal House that's spoken by Doug Kenny when he says, well, what the hell are we supposed to do, you moron? It's a line. That was not intended to be necessarily amusing. It was exposition. That get consistently in every country, in every language, in every theater in the United States I ever saw the movie got a huge laugh. So you cut it. No, it's there, I don't, but I don't know why. I genuinely don't know why it gets such a huge laugh. I've never been able, I've said to people, why is that so funny? And they go, ah, 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 you know, to this day. What's the other one? No, on, on Werewolf, I made a change because of a preview that I think <coughs> hurt my picture uh, commercially, but didn't what, hurt it. What did you change? Uh, it, it, you know, there's a scene with three bubs uh, by the Tower Bridge. Well, they get killed. Uh, the way it is now, you don't really see it. And uh, you did really see it. And it was such a big oh. scare that the audience, we previewed in Chicago and New York, the audience went, ah! and for five <coughs> minutes they were going, did you see that? Oh, you know, that, that, that. And it's such a buzz that I'm in the back of the theater going, shh, 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 you know, there's plot going on. So I cut it out. And I think I probably made a mistake. Because when people talk about Jaws, they always talk about the face and the boat. You know, they talk about Halloween. They, you know, there's always specific things that really That's got them. Dead. And I cut it out of my movie. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I'd like to thank the three of you for joining us on this discussion here on Take One. John Landis, John Carpenter, and David Cronenberg. We look forward to The Thing in Videodrome this summer and your next secret project that I'm sure we'll be hearing about soon. Thanks a lot, and thank you for being with us on Take One.